On behalf of President Sylvia Burwell, uh, uh, Dean Christine Chin from the School of International Service, and my colleagues, I want to thank you for welcoming uh, me to speak here today and for sharing the possibility of developing a project with American University and the Institute, which I hope will uh, bear great fruition. Uh, I have to say at the outset, I am not from Cuba, although I am from a foreign country, Brooklyn, New York, and um, which is foreign to some people. And uh, I do want to thank Mark Donfried for inviting me uh, to talk today about a topic that I think is central to the uh, bringing about of peace in the world and bringing about the, uh, and making cultural diplomacy possible, and that is empathy. Uh, ever since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States has acted as if traditional diplomacy is unnecessary. Instead, the United States has practiced something called coercive diplomacy. It is assumed that diplomacy, without a threat behind it, is meaningless. U.S. foreign policy has been based on fear and it's been a failure. In contrast, traditional diplomacy does not seek victory, but seeks a common ground. Traditional diplomacy does not assume an outcome must be my way or the highway. Traditional diplomacy requires diplomats to understand both adversaries and allies. Former Ambassador Chaz Freeman, one of the most uh, highly regarded diplomats we've had in the last 50 years in the United States, explained in a recent lecture at American University that diplomacy succeeds best when it embraces humility and respects and preserves the dignity of those to whom it is applied. That doesn't happen when you seek victory when you seek to crush your opponent. To engage in such diplomacy, in fact, requires empathy. Ambassador Freeman summed this up by, point, by asserting the basis of diplomacy, he said. The basis of diplomacy is empathy. That's a quote. Now let me explain. Empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy involves sharing a feeling with someone else. Sympathy tends to call on emotions and requires shared values. Empathy is a cognitive process and can be deployed even when two parties do not share values or agree. The practice of empathy requires three steps, none of which are easy. The most common way of thinking about empathy is that you put yourself in someone else's shoes. Well, in order to do that in the first instance, you have to know something about the other person's culture, their language, their history. And often, we don't teach our students anything about that. The second element, which is often neglected, is that you have to see yourself as the adversary sees you. That's even more difficult, especially when it's hard to recognize your own faults. And then the third, the third part of empathy involves accepting that the adversary's fears and grievances are legitimate. I want to get, tell you a story that might help convey what I'm talking about. This past October was the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest we came to nuclear war in the history since we developed nuclear weapons. I was involved in a series of workshops, conferences, that changed how we understand what the cause of the missile crisis was and how it ended. Uh, and importantly, we took into account the positions of all three countries. So that's how we learned new things. The story 
I'm going to tell you comes from one of the conferences, a conference in 1989 that occurred in Moscow. The U.S. delegation that I was part of was headed by former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. And in the delegation, there was uh, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, uh, several generals who were involved in the executive committee of the National Security Council. Uh, and at the dinner before the first day of the conference, we were seated in a large room at a long table hosted by students from the uh, Soviet International Studies, world, this, in, this Institute for World Studies. And uh, of course, they were there to take notes about all of us and report back. Uh, at the start of the dinner, I was sitting at one end of the table and Secretary McNamara was sitting at the other end of the table. And uh, I brought to him some documents that had just been declassified after I had requested uh, them under the Freedom of Information Act. A stack of documents about Operation Mongoose, the largest CIA operation until the US operation in Afghanistan. It was a massive operation intended to overthrow the Cuban government. And his name was all over it. Uh, this occurred before the missile crisis, after the Bay of Pigs. And I brought the stack over to him. And throughout the dinner, I watched as he and uh, McGeorge Bundy uh, rifled through the papers. This is a story that's never been revealed before, I have to tell you. You're hearing it for the first time, as people on YouTube will now watch it. Uh, at the end of the dinner, McNamara gets up and knocks on his glass and says, ah, the Americans, the Americans have to caucus right now. Uh, and John Scalley, the, the chief White House correspondent for ABC, who I was sitting next to, said, oh, Bob, it's getting late. Can't we do this? No, we're going to do this now, with no Russians in the room. Of course, we went to a room that had a lot of microphones in it. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, there were no Russians in the room. And, we, and Professor Joseph Nye from Harvard chaired the meeting. So it would be very neutral. He calls on Bob McNamara, and McNamara says that if the Cubans get a chance to speak at this conference, and there were Cubans invited to the conference, if the Cubans get a chance to speak at this conference, they're going to put us on trial. We have to find a way to stop them from speaking. And so the next hour was spent trying to figure out how to stop the Cubans from speaking. Why don't we just tell them they can't speak? Well, the Soviets aren't going to. Why don't we say that the so this is a conference between Soviets and Americans. After all, the missile crisis was between us. And, and we'll let the Soviets give them whatever time they want. And they won't give them much. No, that's not going to work. Here. If, and so it, after an hour, I said, why don't we do a cost-benefit analysis, which McNamara liked. Why don't we do a cost And we'll say, if the Cubans act badly, we'll leave. But if they don't act badly, maybe we'll learn something. McNamara said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And so we proceeded the next morning to have the conference. After the little caucus meeting, my colleague James Blight, who is now at the Center for Intergovernmental Innovation at the University of Waterloo, but then was at Harvard, went and talked with McNamara and convinced him to see the other side try to engage in empathy. And, the, and Secretary McNamara opened the conference the next morning with the following statement. If I were a Cuban in 1962, I too would have thought the United States wanted to invade Cuba. We didn't. He was lying. We did. But he said we didn't. But nonetheless, if I were a Cuban, I would have imagined the United States did want to do that. I understand that. Wow, what a powerful statement. A statement of empathy, recognizing the other side's grievance, denying the validity that, of the truth of the United States, but nonetheless recognizing the other side and treating them with respect. The conference was an enormous success, changed everything we knew about the missile crisis. And by the end of the conference, 
Secretary Mackner, I was sitting with Jorge Risquet, a member of the Politburo, who was one of the six Cuban participants, and they were smoking cigars and laughing together. An extraordinary exercise in empathy and the power that empathy can bring about to change the way in which you can relate to, to each other. And we can see the importance of empathy in the way in which President Obama initiated uh, conversations with Cuban officials that led to the diplomatic relations that occurred in uh, the recognition of the two countries in 2015. But there was also a lack of empathy involved in, in what President Obama did. Let's start with the empathy. First, it involved mutual respect. The breakthrough came because the people who talked, the Americans who talked with the Cubans, accepted that the Cubans were equals, that there had to be a mutual accommodation. Uh, and as a result, they not only worked out a, a way of establishing diplomatic relations, they, since then, 22 major agreements have, be signed, have were signed between Cuba and the United States. It's quite an accomplishment in a year and a half. And U.S. officials also appreciated that the, the establishment of normal diplomatic relations was not the same thing as establishing normal relations. In order to do that, as you heard, you have to build trust. And so what they attempted to do was build trust uh, over the next short period before Obama left office. But what the Obama officials were not able to do was give up the fundamental assumptions that had guided United States policy since 1898 for the last 120 years. Those two essential assumptions were, first, as a great power, the United States has the right to dominate Cuba, which is a little country. Second, that the United States not only has has the right to dominate, has the responsibility to deny Cuba its independence because Cuba is a country that's not capable of shaping its own destiny, because Cuba is a country that needs unrequested advice, because in effect it's inferior and does not even realize what it needs. And third, Cuba is an immature renegade country that cannot be trusted in, uh, to uphold international norms. Consider that U.S. officials nearly always include a demand or a hope for some kind of internal change in Cuba. Imagine if a Cuban official, in contrast, said every time that he met with the United States or spoke that he hoped that improved relations with the United States would develop a more humane, less greedy, and less self-centered culture so that income inequality would be reduced and everyone in the United States could get health care. Imagine if that were the basis on which Cuba wanted to have engaged with the United States to change internally the United States. We would be quite offended. And it, yet these two essential assumptions that Cuba ought to be dominated by the United States and it's for their own good gets repeated all the time. And it, the, the denial of this kind of respect is the denial of empathy, because mutual respect is the sine qua non of empathy. Let me just give you one example of this. In, when President Obama announced that we, the United States would be recognizing Cuba diplomatically, he said, suddenly Cuba is open to the world in ways that it has not been before. That's not true, Cuba is quite open to the rest of the world. It's open to Americans traveling there in ways that it hasn't been before, that's true. It offers the prospect of telecommunications and the internet being more widely available in Cuba. And over time, that chips away at this hermetically sealed society, which it's not. And I believe offers the best prospect then of leading to greater freedom, greater self-determination, on the part of Cuban people. Through engagement, we have a better chance of bringing about change than we would otherwise. So in the very first instance, President Obama sees this not for the purpose of what we might learn from Cuba, but about 
are benevolence bringing change to them. The second element of this is it doesn't, rec the United States doesn't recognize Cuba's legitimate grievances. Obama said when he went to Cuba in just two years ago, in, in March of 2016, I know the history, but I refuse to be trapped by it. But in fact, he demonstrated an unacceptable ignorance of history when he said, since 1959, we've, meaning Cuba and the United States, been shadow boxes in this battle of geopolitics and personalities. What that statement ignores is that the United States was waging a war against Cuba. And as I just told you, was attempting to overthrow the Cuban government. That's not shadow boxing, that's a war. And it disrespects the legitimate grievance that Cuba's had. It delegitimates Cuba. Words matter, ultimately. Now, it's possible that a pres President Obama felt constrained by domestic politics to pay obeisance to these traditional postures vis-a-vis -vis Cuba. We know he can be empathetic, but it's also important to recognize that what is heard in Cuba is this, not just the domestic part, because that sense of U.S. superiority undermines the possibility of trust. It strengthens the hands of those in Cuba who don't want to have normal relations. It establishes actually an untenable basis for the relationship because it proclaims that when we have this kind of engagement, we will change Cuba, and we probably won't. And ultimately, it provides a rationale for the kind of hardline policy that the Trump administration has put forth. Let me say finally that empathy is possible. As we begin this important conference, it's important to say that it's not easy, but it's possible to deploy empathy. It doesn't require a personality makeover. We can do this because it's a cognitive process, not an emotional process. Empathy is a process of learning how to listen, of learning to respect, and understand that there can be more than one way to bring about peace in the world. Thank you. Let me thank on behalf of all of us uh, to Professor Brenner. Uh, I think that we have a time for maybe one or two questions, if you don't mind. Sorry. Is there somebody that wants to ask the question? I must tell you, before they are preparing the question, I personally am very impressed with your speech, because by, by, by my background, I was professor of psychology who happened to jump into the sea of international relations, and to see somebody bringing the term from psychology, empathy, psychology, it's not just from psychology, no, but it into is. explanation of, of uh, uh, very complex international relations, I very much agree with that, and I, I was quite impressed the way how you, you do it. Thank you. In fact, it's, um, there's very little in the international relations literature about empathy. Uh, it is seen as a topic that is too uh, soft, too uh, emotional. It doesn't have to involve emotions. It, it, it really can be a cognitive process. Any questions? Please. Uh, please yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sufi Lagari with the Sindhi Foundation. Uh, if sympathy and empathy both doesn't work, cognitive and emotions, then what will be other options? What do you think? So, I, sympathy, I think, is very hard when you're dealing with adversaries, uh, because they do have differences of interests. Uh, what uh, two adversaries seek to do is find a common ground where they can live in peace without violating uh, their values. And so the, that's where empathy comes in and, and is different than sympathy. What happens if empathy doesn't work? Well, the United States has not relied on empathy. The United States has relied on its power. That's my point. Uh, and the notion of coercive diplomacy is embedded in what we teach even in the School of International Service at American University, which is committed, in fact, to understanding other cultures, uh, which is committed to finding alternative ways of, of getting to a common agreement, not simply by force. 
But it, that's very hard in, uh, for the United States to accept that because we have such a large commitment to military force. Um, that it provides a lot of jobs. People have been taught in this manner. It's a mindset that needs to be changed. It is, in fact, an ideology that we don't even recognize as an ideology. So this is a long process of changing people's mind. Let's take, if you agree, those two more questions then. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Zane Rodolfo. Um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I have a question. I'm, I'm curious uh, how it's possible for the U.S., um, considering where the rest of the world has engaged with Cuba and like the incredible uh, health care uh, system, their schools, their education, um, the ways that they've engaged with everybody, uh, you know, uh, sharing their culture, their music uh, since the 40s. And I'm wondering, you know, there's been, you know, international engagement um, you know, you see students from all over the world go to Cuba, uh, you know, to engage with their, you know, medical education. So I'm wondering, at this day and age, you know, what do you think the issue is that's uh, disallowing the U.S. from engaging with them in that way? Well, the United States is the richest country in the world. Um, and Cuba needs investment. Uh, it needs technology that uh, is very expensive to obtain elsewhere. It needs food. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, its interest in having a better relationship with the United States is precisely to uh, work in those areas. And ultimately, the interest is to uh, end the war. You know, the United States still has an embargo against Cuba. Uh, Cubans call it a blockade. And that embargo is based on a 100-year-old law uh, trading with the Enemy Act from 1917 that the Congress passed uh, during World War I. Um, and the, uh, so officially, we're at war with Cuba. That we declare Cuba as an enemy. And so uh, for a very small country to be at war with the most powerful country in the world is, means that they have to expend more than they should on national security. And ending that war is really very important for them. And we have one more question. This will be quick. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm in college here, in college here at AU. Um, sorry, I was late to your class. Um, you said it's not easy, but it's possible to have empathy. I love that quote. But then you said something after. You said uh, pragmatic pra something. Can you say what you said? I want to finish your quote. You started with it's not easy, but I said, yeah. but it's possible. And what you yeah. need to be able to do is you need to learn how to listen, to respect, and to understand that it's possible to make peace in more than one way. 